Hi everyone, welcome to the International Public Library Fundraising Conference, virtual style. Uh, my name is John Ward, and I'm the CEO of the Seattle Public Library Foundation, and I just am thrilled to have you here with us. Back in 2016, it was just after the presidential election, um, lots was happening and I was feeling isolated. I felt I needed inspiration. And Christina McPhillips from Carl Bloom Associates was in town and we got to talking and hatched up this idea about taking her contacts, my contacts, and um, see who would come to Seattle and spend a couple days together and just share what we were learning, what we were working on, and um, that's how this conference was born. Uh, then we fast forward to 2020. In January, we just started planning for the conference. Uh, it was to be in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Tim Staley, for that. Um, but COVID-19 struck and uh, we thought, well, should we try to do this virtual? Uh, easier said than done. Uh, little did we know what we're getting into, but we're here and we've managed to, I guess, get this far. Uh, the only reason we could get this far is because we have an incredible partner in Carl Bloom Associates and without their generous in-kind support, none of this would exist. So just please join me and say thanks to uh, Rob Bloom, President, Christina McPhillips, who's the VP of Business Development, Kenny Weingarten, who is the Senior Project Manager, uh, and Carrie Bloom and all the others at CBA who have helped make this happen. Uh, we also have some incredible sponsors who have helped us as well. First off, I just want to say uh, thank you to two of our sponsors who have been with us every step of the way. That's Campaign Council, as well as Library Strategies Consulting Group. And also joining us as sponsors this year, I want to say thanks to Bloomerang, uh, Campbell Rinker, Every Library Institute, and Giving Design. Now, I... So let's set the tone. Let's talk a little bit about the spirit of, of this. And especially if you're uh, participating for the first time, we really are glad to have you here and want to say welcome. Um, I have been known uh, to describe this conference as homespun, and that is not meant to diminish it in any way, but it really is to set expectations. Um, this is all put together by volunteers. It's a labor of love uh, where we want to share and help grow library philanthropy peers teaching one another, what better than that, um, keynotes that can provide some insights and inspirations and some big picture views of things. And of course the meetups, which in the virtual mode are meant to try to recreate the sense of community and um, getting to know one another and finding people who are looking at the world like you do or similar organizations or what have you. Um, but I also just had to say thank you so much to our presenters. Uh, they're willing to share what they know. Uh, there took a lot of blind faith here because we said it's good virtual, trust us. Um, and they did. And many of our uh, presentations are pre-recorded. It's one way to avoid some technical glitches. And um, we just really can't say enough good things about the content uh, that's coming on that you're gonna be learning about. And speaking of content, um, these are things that you've asked for. Uh, things that you're working on, things that we know are important to support library and library philanthropy. So it's three big focus areas. First, you've got the fundraising, which is about our private support. Um, advocacy, which is about securing and protecting uh, public funding. And then marketing and communications, which is really a way to make your work more impactful. So I hope you find the content compelling and that you participate in the Q&A that will be facilitated with the presenters uh, at the end of each section. Now, this conference, what it's really about, it's really about this informal network that has formed. Um, and we have kind of created something special. Uh, thanks to the network, it's led to the Library Giving Day and we'll be sharing results from year two on Wednesday. Uh, and it's enabled us to do some primary research that we hope starts to send some benchmarks that we can measure against moving forward. And that will be our keynote on Tuesday. But most importantly, it's brought all of us together to share and to grow. And I believe we've barely scratched the surface on the power of this informal network. And it's growing because there are 300 of us, at last I looked, uh, part of this conference, 
That's double what we were able to do in person last year. Um, and so we'll also uh, provide a poll. You would have, if you haven't done the poll, please, please do the poll. Um, and we'll share who's in the room, so to speak, uh, with all of you at the end. And um, boy, use the, use the tool to meet up and get to know people, reach out to people, host a meetup if you have a topic that you want discussed. All those are things that can happen through this conference. So uh, we coming together, learning, uh, it feels more important right now than it ever has. And when COVID struck, Carl Bloom Associates uh, was able to help us put together a, a webinar. And a few of us came together to share what we were doing uh, for decision making around canceling events and fundraising. And then we face our second, you know, unprecedented unprecedented uh, profound moment in time and that is you know what's happening with the all the emotion and action around uh, racial injustice and certainly the killing of George Floyd has catalyzed our country and libraries need to be at the table in our communities because they can help create systematic change um, systemic change they can bring our library people together in our communities like no one else can um, and they can play a key role in helping heal our fractured society and we we are the ones that can propel that work we can help find the funding that your library needs to do the equity work and focus on that we can help create partnerships that they need and through our work with our own boards with our staff um, and with our donors i think we can make a difference too so when we developed this conference, we were not, I hate to admit, but we were not thinking about or talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It wasn't in the forefront, but we recognize we're at an inflection point and it's a call to action. And we can speak up and we can do more. I also want you to know that several, most of the recordings of presentations were done before the protests started. So do keep that in mind, um, but use the Q&A time as a way to overlay the race and social justice lens that that we need to have. So I thinking of COVID, thinking of the the protesting, thinking about the uncertainty of our economy, all of those things really bring us to this point. And I've been in library development for 19 years now. And it's extraordinary to see how libraries have changed over that time. We started out focused on books and buildings, and now we've got vibrant community hubs and your libraries are doing amazing programming for the community, things that we never existed. And I believe we have this moment in time where we are really on the verge of a library renaissance. And the silver lining with COVID is that in some ways it helped us hurdle or leap over the hurdle of our libraries even relevant anymore and we have people discovering e-materials even though we've been talking about them for years um, we have people who have had a profound loss of a lifeline that is so important to them with our libraries closing and we certainly have um, you know we have patrons that are grappling with some real profound changes and that are happening in society right now so we can be the ones that help harness this moment. We can secure resources for our libraries to do the important work they need to do. And we can do this because we have each other to help learn from and grow from and, and ensure we're more successful. So before I close out and transition to our first keynote, just let me say thank you again for registering for the conference. I sincerely hope you find these next three days stimulating, thought provoking, that you come away with a golden nugget from every session or a new insight or maybe some inside information. And in fact, that's a little bit of what you're going to hear next. It's a conversation between Crosby Kemper, who's the former director of the Kansas City Public Library. And that's where he established the library as one of the city's leading cultural institutions and destinations, as well as a community engagement hub. And in January, he was picked to be the head of the Institute of Museum and Library Services. That's the independent government agency that's the primary source of federal support for our nation's museums and libraries. 
Now, Crosby is in conversation with Marcellus Turner, and he's the executive director and chief librarian of the Seattle Public Library. And during MT's tenure, uh, SPL has made a very deep commitment to centering its work and thinking about um, embedding its work in the values of the community and equity. And in fact, since the conversation was recorded, SPL was awarded the Gale Library Journal Library of the Year for its equity work. And we're really proud of that work. It is deep and true and in the fiber of that institution. So I hope you enjoy the conversation with these two uh, leaders, and then we'll circle back and catch up with you at, after their keynote session. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Jenna. And I too am really happy to be here with you today uh, at this virtual conference. I've had the luxury and opportunity to attend the previous ones. And I was so looking forward to it. Uh, we were going to be in Austin, but hey, fingers are crossed for next year. But I'm really glad to be here and have joining us Crosby Kemper. And Crosby, um, I have a couple of questions for you. The first one is, what's the joy of doing a virtual meeting right now? You didn't have to wear a tie. I half loosened mine. Yeah, uh, so I noticed that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm impressed that you put put your tie on. I, I was th it, uh, asking myself whether or not I should wear my wearing a blue blazer. It's the first time since going virtual that I uh, put this blazer on. So I thought I was dressing up for you, and here you had your very handsome tie. Well, I figured you would wear a jacket, so I grabbed the jacket, but this is my third taping today. So in one, it's the tie is on, one is off, and one, the jacket is off. So it's doing triple duty today. Well, they're but new I, rules. Let's face that. They're new rule, rules. And that, and that, of course, is the joy of, of being virtual. We can, we can sort of invent things as we go along and, and uh, try things out. I am, for instance, trying out a beard. I have never oh. had a beard before. I didn't think I could grow one. And it's not much of a beard there so well i will say this as a person who's had a beard a beard since ninth grade and has never cut it uh it looks good on you so keep it thank going you, thank you I'm, I'm just trying to keep up with you mt good so uh crosby we're really glad you're joining us as i i saw you back in um february at a meeting in miami and was telling you about this conference and was hopeful that you would be able to join us and at the time i thought it would be uh an in-person conference and and we find ourselves um, meeting virtually. But just for the record, um, we've known each other for a couple of years now, and I just can't remember. I remember more meetings with you than I remember the actual time. I think we met at that Knight Foundation conference a couple of years ago, and then we met at it again this year. Yeah, I remember our first long conversation was at a Knight Foundation conference three or four years ago. And, yeah, uh, so in Miami, of uh, of course. Yeah, you you were you were. It was the one where they had the folks from Aarhus. Yes. Uh, remember that? And you and I were both a little skeptical that the sort of happy faces in Aarhus were exactly like our patrons and and, uh, and and an American library. So true, so true. But it was good. And, and that was the start of a really great relationship. And I'm so glad that I know you and have this opportunity to meet with you in your new position. So uh, just for the record, what does that new position have you doing? And then we'll move into libraries. Well, so the IMLS is essentially the federal government agency that has some responsibility uh, for libraries and museums. And uh, we, our primary responsibility is to make grants and the grants, uh, at least for the last decade or decade and a half have really been uh, gr grants uh, about uh, leadership, about ideas, about the demonstration projects, about things that libraries are thinking about doing uh, and have the funds for, or uh, an experiment. Uh, and, uh, and and the same thing is true uh, in, in museums. We used to give operating money, but really uh, today it's project money. And then of course the the uh, uh, the coronavirus and and uh, the CARES Act changed that a little bit more in that we're, we're right now getting some money uh, away tr trying to directly address uh, the issues that are created by the pandemic. So Crosby, um, recognizing that we are in this pandemic and um, you're working in a new job, I guess my question to you would be, 
if you haven't totally let go of libraries just yet and the role you formerly had, what are your observations on what's happening to us right now? Well, I think the, the, the huge problem for, for libraries is uh, the public space question and the use of, uh, of, of the space, which have been growing so dramatically in terms of programming, public programming, partnership with uh, other community uh, organizations, uh, lots of activities that libraries had not engaged in before, whether it's lectures, theatrical performances, um, uh, music, uh, uh, all, dance, all kinds of things that, that were happening. And that's all going to be very difficult to do uh, uh, going forward. Uh, it was a, a big accelerating trend. As, as people left the library as a, as a repository of books, as electronic books have grown uh, and electronic information, the reference library, librarian uh, uh, has become much more specialized, organized information. Um, the, the people coming to the library to read, et cetera, were declining, uh, but that was replaced by people doing activities in the library. Um, and that is going to be a great challenge going forward. The electronic world, of course, the other, the other side of that is that the use of the library uh, electronically, uh, virtually, will, will be dramatically expanded. Good. So we're certainly experiencing that. And certainly, while we were closed, um, we recognized how quickly we had to ramp up services for access to our electronic materials and collections. And even part of it was focused on getting our staff ready. As much as you think that we work in this information world, uh, when we sent them home, it was a whole different story that we had to think about. So that is, that is the case there. And recognizing those two things, what, um, how do I say this? We know that we all receive money from some government capacity from either from our city's general fund or through special uh, district taxing in some form or fashion. But we all know that money doesn't go as far as we need it to. And so we have to look to private dollars to help us with that and foundations and grants and all of that. With regard to our foundations, is there anything that they can cling to in those two points to think about with regard to reaching out to donors? Sure, and, and I think we, we've, we've already experienced this. Uh, the IMLS has experienced this. We've gone to some foundations to help us with what we call our Realm Project, which is about reopening libraries and, and museums and, and uh, doing serious research. We have Battelle doing some serious research with the virus on, uh, on uh, library and museum materials um, and, and finding funding for that in the private sector among foundations has been uh, I wouldn't say easy to do, but it's been, it's been welcomed uh, by the foundations. And I found some of the larger foundations in the country uh, that have historically been interested in libraries, um, uh, but had, had maybe that, li that library interest had waned a little bit in recent years, is now back at the top of the, uh, of the list because they recognize libraries do two things that are really important. One, in the current environment, in a pandemic environment, the electronic information is hugely important, uh, and and the digital and libraries are the place where the digital divide gets crossed. And in a universe such as we're in today, the electronic information, community information, health information, uh, ultimately job information, going to be hugely important. Virtual education will become more important, and libraries play a key role in all of that. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, one of the great things that about libraries as community anchors, which is challenged now, the libraries of public space, we're going through the last four or five days in this country have been a terrible, terrible time in this country. And we need to do a lot of healing. Uh, and and, and one, one of the ways we're gonna do that is to bring people together. And, and literally bringing them together in the library is gonna be one of the most important things that happens over the next couple of years. Uh, and, and that's gonna be more difficult. But I think foundations, there are leader, leadership foundations, some of the larger foundations will recognize that, uh, have recognized that historically. And, uh, and, the, and they'll, there'll be opportunities in every community to go to foundations and, and some corporate uh, funders and some parts of, of the local, uh, regional, state governments and say the library's importance in this universe is 
deep. I mean, we remember uh, after at Ferguson um, when when the when the problems we had in Ferguson happened, the important role that the library played. It was it was the first place that people could gather not only after but actually during uh, the uh, the violence, and uh, and I think that 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 is something uh, is a story for for libraries to tell in their in their communities and nationally. I think so too, and certainly um, we're taping this a bit earlier for the conference, and certainly we've just experienced the incident. Um, across the country and and certainly all libraries are thinking about how they step into this space to help with the healing we certainly are a part of the city and doing our our role in helping with that you know this conference the beauty of this con this conference is absolutely amazing i wish you really could have been to, been able to attend it but um i go every year and what the beauty of it is is that i meet uh larger libraries than spl but i certainly visit with directors from smaller library systems and in some instances they do not necessarily have their own uh, development or fundraising department. They are truly, the director is truly the fundraiser, the right. everything. And, and that can be overwhelming to approach a big corporation and say, hey, we're this library system and we need some money or some help. How, how would you even recommend that they even start that approach or that task? Because it can be daunting to think about all that they have to do just to get uh, the attention or get in the door to that person. Well, I, you know, the first thing to do, and there's some library directors that you and I know who are really, really fabulous at, uh, at this, is to become a part of the community leadership, the, uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, to, you, know, you join the, uh, the Rotary and do things like that at, at the basic level but then become a, a figure in the Chamber of Commerce if there is a, a strategic planning uh, going on uh, at, at, in the business community, in the civic community, be a part of that. Make, make sure you're a big part of that. And in that process, you'll get to know uh, the, the, uh, the business leaders and the foundation leaders, if there are foundations in your community, uh, the not-for-profit leaders. And, uh, and, and then it will, come, it will be natural for, for, for you to go to them and, and be able to talk to them about your own funding needs if you've gotten to know them in that kind of uh, environment. So that, that's the first and most important thing to do. And you know, it, you, you have to be willing to, to listen to somebody say no to you and, uh, and, and, and get up and, and, uh, from that and, and, and go back out and ask the next person and, and be willing to come back next year and ask the person who turned you down and who may have said something about libraries being a 19th century institution or, or, uh, or, or whatever. And uh, just you have to keep going. And it's a lesson. It's a lesson, basic lesson in life, but it's absolutely true in fundraising. Is you, you know, it's like like uh, you know Hemingway receiving all those all those uh, rejections in the first couple of years of his uh, uh, of his writing life. Um, you you got to take no, and and eventually you'll get to yes. Yeah, I, I agree. I think about um, in in some of my opportunities, my first ask of major money from someone and. And the knees were wobbly, and um, I don't know how I presented, but I got a little bit. So uh, that was encouraging for the next ask uh, as we went along. What, what, you know, we think about, we need, libraries think about needing these big amounts of money, but we know that a lot of our money comes from private donors uh, and smaller donors at that. Are the ask the same? Do I ask that person who's able to give $5 every month do I present them with the same need and request, or is it a different approach, or any thoughts about that? Because so many of us depend on the smaller donors to help us out. Well, I think the, the thing about the smaller donors is you're always doing something for them. Most of the smaller donors are people who are users of the library. And so it's important to that to, to do a couple of things. Number one, you always have to recognize every donor. They're all important, and it's that $5 you know, five dollar a month or twenty five for fifty dollar a year donor who turns out to leave you the, their entire estate, and they may not have been wealthy, but five hundred thousand or a million dollars uh, can go a long way in, uh, for a library, uh, and it's always always surprising. Um, 
and, and so I think recognition re, re, and, and that can, can come in technologically sophisticated or unsophisticated ways. You can send lots of uh, uh, direct mail out and make sure you're hitting those folks who give you the $25 a year uh, with that, with the direct mail. But it's also uh, the librarian, the frontline librarian the, at, at the CERC desk at the, uh, at, at, at the public service librarians remembering the person and, and knowing their name uh, is is really important um, and and it and the service the, the basic service of libraries uh, is so important and and giving that service with uh, with a smile and some warmth is, is very important a lot of librarians when I first showed up in the library world a little over 15 years ago that there were a lot of there was some resentment in frontline librarians to be treated as retail uh, oriented uh, folks, um, but really what we're talking about, and, and some of what I'm advocating is is, is a little bit the, the style of the uh, the Walmart greeter is you know smile and say hello, uh, but really what that is all about is human warmth, and uh, and librarians are actually pretty good at that, and uh, and and emphasizing that, I'm always trying to remember people's names and and who they are. Sure. So your comments are giving me so many different directions to go in, and I want to be mindful of our time. But I have three questions, I think, if I can remember all of them. The first one is, and this is something that I say, and I don't know your approach to it or your thinking around it, is that um, the front of the house is the library. That is where we serve the public and really reach out into the communities and deliver the services that they want. And the back of the house is where we really have to operate a bit like a business. And sometimes that's offending to a lot of the frontline librarians to say you've got to run it like a business. But that is where you really do have to operate like a business and bringing in the revenue to help it operate is key. Is that your approach to this? Because I've met many directors who say I'm really focused on getting books into the system or providing this service. And I say I am too, but I have to pay the bills and turn the lights on every day as well. And part of that means reaching out to the community. So what's your thought on that? Well, I, I, you, you, have to, you have to be efficient. Um, and, and, and certainly one of the, one of the challenges uh, for me in my, my career was whenever we used technology, uh, 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 when we went to uh, uh, automated checkout, uh, when uh, when we go to materials handling systems, um, there's always a fear among librarians that they're losing the the, the touch uh, with the patron or the touching the book or whatever whatever it might be. But there are things that we have to do uh, in, in in order to make it more efficient. Now we were always able to do that in Kansas City without laying anybody off. We just simply repurposed. Uh, people and mostly repurpose people into direct contact with uh, with our patrons um, and, uh, and and doing outreach and, and that sort of thing. Um, so you have to you have to do that. And we have to be mindful of that. And then and the most difficult problem it seems to me is is the library staffing cost and the the, the grades of library uh, uh, compensation. And uh, you, you're in Seattle, so you know you've got a, a high minimum wage, and and uh, and the, uh, the fight over that. Uh, we we created our own internal minimum wage in the library in in Kansas City, raised it reasonably substantially, not to your level, by the way. Um, and uh, and I think that I think that's being mindful of that is really important. Um, but yeah, it is a, it, ultimately it's a business. Ultimately, you have a certain amount of revenue, and you have to get as much service out of that revenue as you can, and that means you have to be efficient, um, and uh, uh, and 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 you can't do all the things that you want to do. No, I agree. The and and part of the conversation there, as well as a comment that you made earlier, makes me ask my next question. When we go out to funders to do this work, one of the things that SPL has focused on in the last couple of years, probably the last four years, four to five years, is that we've moved from um, uh, we moved to an outcomes and impacts based approach. We know that our donors want to hear what we what the impact of what we're doing is, as opposed to we added 600,000 new library cards this year. How important is that to a donor to hear? 
the outcome and the impact of the work that you're doing as opposed to we just bought 800 new books with the money you gave us. Yeah, I think that's huge. And I think it's been a good direction for libraries and other public institutions to go is to figure out uh, what the real impact in the community is. That's the IMLS. That those are the two most important words in our mission statement or community impact. We're, we're trying to leverage our grants uh, through the community impact of, uh, of libraries and museums. So I think that's really important. Defining that is very difficult. Um, and, 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 then, and then we're talking about fundraising, so selling that. We went out for a levy increase about two years ago in the Kansas City Public Library. And we were, our consultant said there are two things you can't mention, but there are two of our biggest impacts in the community. Homelessness, we are, to go to the Central Library is a, a, a very important place for the homeless in, in the community. And the other, the other thing we were told not to mention as we were going out to the voters were teenagers. And, uh, and we do an awful lot with teenagers and a lot of the most successful things, the impactful things, the things that do have uh, an impact on, on the community um, have to do with, with our work with, with teen groups, particularly the, the, those who are coming from uh, disturbed family situations, uh, 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 from poverty, uh, uh, for, who are some one way or another dissociated from the normal social aspects of life. And, uh, and, and that's huge, but we're told we couldn't tell voters about it. Now, on the other hand, we can tell the foundation community about it. We can tell the corporate community about those, those things, they, and they are a very high impact. The digital divide is a really good example of something that has a huge impact. It's hard, we can measure it in some statistical ways, metrical ways, but, but the real impact is, is ultimately on education, it's on school achievement, is on integration into the community economically, uh, is healthcare information, and and it's hard for us at this stage to to measure that outcome, but we know we're having it. Yeah, yeah, it's a it it has been the difference when we moved into this outcomes and impact and helping staff see that even something as simple as saying we bought X number of books. Um, that's a great number, but what we say is now this gives access to worlds of collections and authors that people have never experienced. So I think the story is an easy twist on that. So I have one last question for you uh, because our time is near. And I guess it's a tie-in. Uh, it's two questions actually, Crosby, so uh, I'll be honest. Um, we're, the last question I want to ask of you is, what is your view on um, where libraries have to go from here? Um, I'm very encouraged by, even by, by incidents like this most recent event, even pandemic, all of those things, I'm still encouraged that libraries have a role and work for us to do. And how do we make that known? I think you've covered it a bit, but how do we rely on the work of our frontline staff to help us carry that message forward? There are librarians who are doing this work every day and they may question um, their, their work at this time right now. And we really want to be encouraging and say to donors, hey, we're still doing great work. Here's what our librarians are doing. Here's what our staff is doing. What's your thought on that? How, what is your last encouraging word for us on this? Well, my encouraging word is is that I think libraries are essential in communities. I think we're to, we're in a moment when information is really important. The, the, the knowledge that comes from from information is really important, whether it's about the virus or uh, or or it's about how we get along with each other. And uh, and libraries libraries are are the most trusted institution in America, other than first responders, other than uh, the military and uh, fire and police um, and police. Having their own challenges right now, um, and uh, and we're, we're a trusted institution, and 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 we're, we're trusted both as a gathering place, as a neutral place, uh, uh, and we're trusted as uh, uh, as as a place of knowledge. And I don't think there's any more important thing in this country than those the combination of those two things. Uh, and and so I think we have something to tell, a story to tell. I think we have to tell it. And I, and I think that the one danger, the one thing we have to worry about, library directors should be worrying about this, is our frontline staff and our patrons are, are all worried about coming together because of the pandemic. And we have to do whatever we can to reduce the fear factor 
uh, and and to uh, to bring librarians back to being those engaged community uh, frontliners uh, that they they've always been and have been particularly in the last 20 years. We need to we need to re reinvigorate that uh, as as we begin to reopen. I think that's a good point because as we're able to do that and prove to the community our value and worth, hopefully the dollars will follow. Uh, hopefully, I, I think will. that's true. Good, good. Well, I think that brings us to a close. I'm going to apologize right here because I never got my camera set straight. So I was always shuffling and shifting it to try to make sure I was looking directly at you. And that didn't seem to be the case, but hey, Crosby, all the best in your new job. And I promise you that if they hold this conference next year in person, it will be well worth your time to visit with us. I'll be there, I'll be there. And I'm looking forward to coming to Seattle sometime soon. Hey, you, on the first flight that we can get you on, we'll get you here. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Okay, great take care. Great you. being with you. Yeah, all right. thank you so much. Thank you all, yeah. Of course. Bye -bye. Well, hello everyone. We hope you enjoyed that session. I am pulling up my very good friend, Jonna Ward right now. We will see her in one moment. Hi, Jonna, are you there? Yeah, but I got to change my camera view, don't I? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Thank you, I knew how to do that. All right. Here you are. Are we gonna pull up as well? Yes, we are pulling her up right now. Hi, everyone. We're actually live now. Oh, we did it. Okay, so uh, kudos to Christina and Katie for uh, getting us to this point in time. Um, I'm hoping to introduce both of them, but first off, I just want to say I'm Jonna. I'm wearing the same shirt as I was wearing before. I had to try to figure this out. Um, so Christina is Christina Phillips, and she will be uh, basically behind the scenes running uh, the sessions. And then Katie Weingarten will be also running sessions since we have concurrent ones happening. And so this is a, a technical magic happening. Um, and hopefully, you know, you're going to see different qualities. All of us have different bandwidth. Some will see a little more uh, uh, lagging. Others will have a fairly crisp uh, delivery. And um, I do want to take a second, though. I think there were a couple questions. <laughs> and I'm going to see if I can pull them up here because my screen is, has a little, like, construction sign going, and I really can't see any other questions. So I'm not sure what that's about. First off, though, one of the questions that came in is, how do you encourage your library employees to be donors to a library foundation or friends? And um, there are a lot of people who will have opinions across the board um, and answers in different ways of doing that. But one thing I'll just add to say is that um, things like Library Giving Day have been just such a natural way to expand our involvement with library staff. And they've taken on a role, um, even becoming much more ambassadors. And we have miles to go, but we do have hundreds of donors now, and it's taken a long time. And, a lot of this comes back to um, creating a culture of philanthropy in your organization. And that kind of relates to the next question that was, talk more about measuring impact versus patron privacy. We have such a hard time getting our librarians to feel comfortable in collecting information so we can show impact. Oh my goodness, there, there could be a whole conference about that one. Um, one area though I'm optimistic about is that within the library profession, within the professional trade associations, there is more and more attention being given to the value of moving on to helping things. And, um, you know, your partnership with your library, your library's own involvement with um, the need to prove their impact with elected officials or wherever the funding comes from. I think we're all on this journey together and we've got a ways to go but there's more work to be done. And so that's probably not the best answer I could possibly come up with, but it is certainly one. And then I think there was one more question, but meanwhile, I don't even hear Christina and I don't even hear Katie. So are you guys out there? Yeah, can you hear me, Jonna? This is Katie. Oh, and you I are. see Christina. You are. Hi there. Okay. <clears throat> 
Oh, Hi, go ahead. Do you want to share the poll results? I'd love to share the poll results. Pardon me while I mute you, uh, while I minimize you all for a moment. Okay, so we asked a few questions. We said, have you attended this conference before? And of course, what we mean is in person. And so the results of that were that 40% of you have and 60% have not. So welcome, we're so glad to have you. The next question we asked was, what time of, type of organization do you represent? And the answers were 30% represent a library, 40% represent a foundation, and 25% represent a combination. We do have 5% of the people that responded saying that they represent a friends organization. So the combination would be, you know, a combination of a, a foundation, a friends, or a library. We have quite a lot of those, about a quarter of you in the audience. And then we asked one final question, which was, what position do you hold? We have about 30% of the people attending are a CEO or an executive director. 11% are library directors. Ooh, and then we have 45%, which are development staff, and 5% that are communications staff. Um, we have no volunteers and no library directors currently on this session that answered these questions, uh, but we do have a few board members, about three board members. So thanks for coming and thanks for your commitment. And um, those were the answers of the polls. All right, well, I just wanna close this session out and just by saying, Enjoy, have fun, and hopefully join us for breakout sessions this afternoon where we'll have a lot more interaction time and being able to uh, help one another. So thank you all. And uh, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you.